Hello, everyone. Good day and welcome to the Fundamental Rights Forum 2021 session, The Power of Narrative Together for Equality and Human Rights. My name is Anna Tretinjak and I am the spokesperson at the Office of the Ombudswoman of Croatia and also the co-moderator of the Equinet Working Group on Communication Strategies and Practices. I'm also very happy to share today the moderation role with, with my dear colleague, Jason. Hello, Jason. Hi, thanks very much, Anna. Hi, I'm Jason McKeown. I do engagement. I'm the engagement and communications officer for the Northern Ireland Human Rights Commission. And I'm also the chair of the ENRI Working Group on Communications. Um, to jump right into our into our panel discussion today, um, communication has the has the power to create change in society and helps to bring helps people understand their rights and empowers them to bring about change. And then what does this look like in practice? So this session, which is brought to you by Henry and Aquanet, will illustrate uh, how powerful narratives and targeted messaging can encourage people to act. NHRI's national human rights institutions and equality bodies have man mandates to promote and protect human rights and equality. And communications and communicating human rights and equality form an essential part of this work. So both ENRI and Equinet have communications working groups that help to aid NHRI's and equality bodies through promoting best practice, collaboration, capacity building, and, um, and many other things. And so we're going to hear from a few examples uh, from a few kind of organizations that have done campaigns. So over to Anna. Yes, uh, that's correct. We will hear first from Lisa Pacosta, who is the Estonian Gender Equality and Equal Treatment Commissioner. Then we will hear from Klaas Amundsen, who is Director of Communications and Engagement at Danish Institute for Human Rights. And after that, from Beatrice Berna, who is head of training sector at the Romanian Institute for Human Rights. The examples that they will share with us will clearly show how collaboration with rights holders and with civil, civil society is actually the bedrock of successful campaigns. We will also see how uh, young people actually can make a difference in human rights and in equality. Uh, after we hear the examples, we will go to a short discussion uh, where we will touch upon questions such as uh, how to measure the impact of the campaigns. At the end, uh, we will have the key takeaways for creating inspiring communication initiatives that tackle uh, equality and human rights challenges. So now we can start with the first presentation. Lisa Pacosta, you have the floor. Hello, everybody. My name is Lisa Pakosta. I am the Gender Equality and Equal Treatment Commissioner of Estonia, and it's my great honor here to be today and to introduce to you with one of our stories. Why not? This is actually about uh, gender stereotypes uh, and of a small part of it, how to change gendered career paths. In Estonia, uh, there just yesterday was uh, prime minister and president female. We very much hope that these role models come from our project, which dates back actually already 2016, but is still ongoing. Uh, and our idea was that uh, in order to change gendered career paths, you need good role models. You need those role models in a good mood. And we also used cross media possibilities. As you might know, Estonia has the biggest uh, gender pay gap in European Union, and we also have extremely gender se segregated labor market. These two things seem to go hand in hand. And we are topping in the world with our gender biased education choices. So it might be also said that narrative behind all this might be a problem, but I uh, very much believe it's also a solution. So what we did uh, in order to get to the results, we uh, built a new narrative and we encouraged with this new narrative, hope, private solutions for non-gender biased uh, career paths and courage to be your true self. So we produced a TV series 
Uh, this TV series uh, from eight, with eight episodes were broadcasted by the Estonian National Broadcasting, but not only. It was also broadcasted in Lithuania, our partner, and Iceland, our partner in this EU co-financed uh, project. So uh, we had to take into account that our TV series are not Estonian-based, but are uh, understandable in all EU cultures. So what is the story about? The story is about uh, gender stereotypes as barriers. The main character is a stuttering girl who wants to become a rap star. Now she has a minority uh, friend who is very supportive, but is basically the only one who is supportive. But during the series, her father changes from a boss to a men's underwear designer, what he has dreamed uh, for many years already to become. Her mother uh, finally dares to become a boss. Her grandfather uh, returns back to labor market after being retired for a longer time. Her brother starts to deal with his burnout and included into this series, there are a lot of real life work and school discrimination episodes or discrimination cases that are actually included to this uh, series. So let's uh, see the trailer. Ma olen Anna Sooveli. Ma olen üks kokutav hunikõnnetust, kes tahab saada rajuks ja kuulseks räppariks. As said before, it was not only on TV, but we used a lot of uh, cross media. So uh, simultaneously to the TV series, there was uh, radio included, social media included, exhibitions and events at school and youth centers included. So the aim was to get also the young people to watch TV. The real result was actually that all the generations uh, were watching these series and the national broadcasting repeated it and they repeated it again and again and again. Uh, uh, as I mentioned, schools, uh, then we had a special program also for schools, for example, also with alternative endings to the uh, TV episodes so that pupils could discuss uh, the solutions to the discrimination episodes. Thank you, Lisa Liba Costa, for the opportunity. Hello, uh, Fundamental Rights Forum of Europe. It's a pleasure to speak here briefly. My name is Thomas Luhatz and I'm the editor-in-chief of uh, Estonian Public Broadcasting's FVOD platform called Jupiter. And um, we have had a series called Mix Mitte in our platform. It has been enjoyed by all audiences, including youth, but also elderly people. And um, power of narrative, I understand, is the topic of uh, today's mm. conference. Therefore, um, uh, the power of narrative in mixed mitte case is that uh, hope is important and hope is something that every one of us should have. We uh, very much welcome that kind of stories in our platform. We will do our own series soon and uh, mixed mitte is a very good example of uh, what can be um, reached with uh, relatively small uh, budgets but... Uh, with a good power of narrative. So this was a testimony uh, from the streaming platform of uh, Estonian National Broadcasting. And, and as you could hear, this series is popular up to 2021. Um, and not only, actually this uh, a TV series, uh, which is a state propaganda on, on gender stereotypes issue, got uh, Best TV Screenplay Award from our local, local Oscars uh, ceremony and first time ever on this stage at the acceptance speech, uh, uh, a quality body was said, thank you so much for these real life stories that we included in our screenplay. And not only this, actually this series was elected among five best TV series for youth in the world 
uh, during 2018, and it was presented in Bangkok in the Input uh, International uh, Conference of the Best uh, Youth Series. So thank you so much for your attention, and I really hope that uh, the storytelling is helping to solve more and more everyday problems and challenges that we have around us in equality and human rights issues. Thank you so much. And if you wish, you can see this series. It has also English subtitles. That's uh, brilliant, Lisa. Thank you so much. That's amazing. Um, an award-winning mini-series. Um, <laughs> is um is quite something and that's that's i suppose that's that's a great example of of sort of listening and connecting with your audience and and knowing your platform and adapting your kind of approach and and connecting with them through kind of positive messaging so it's absolutely super um it'd be great to to tease out in our in our questions coming up um so yes just Next up, I'd like to jump in and I'd like to introduce Claes Amundsen, who's the Communications Director at the Danish Institute for Human Rights. And he'll be speaking on their campaign around buses for everyone, um, accessibility on public buses for persons with physical disabilities in Denmark. Claes. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. And so when was the last time you took a public bus? And uh, did you have stop a moment and contemplate about how difficult, or perhaps how easy it was to get on board. I can say that this is something I've never really thought about until I saw a video that I'm going to show you in a few minutes. So let me just find my presentation here. And uh, yes, the title of the campaign was indeed uh, Buses for Everyone. And um, the reasons for this was that actually Copenhagen is one of the capitals in Europe where it's most difficult to, to enter a bus if you are in a wheelchair. Uh, and this is not only true for Copenhagen, but for many of the major cities around in Denmark. And this young student from Ireland found out the hard way. Um, another day in Denmark, another bus driver who refuses to help me and tells me I need an assistant. And as she wrote in another tweet, this would never have happened in Ireland. At the Danish Institute for Human Rights, we have known about this problem for some time, and we wanted to look into it. So we published uh, this report uh, with this slightly longer subtitle, yeah. And what we found out was this, that first of all, that five out of six bus companies in Denmark cannot ensure what we call spontaneous and independent travel. Uh, and the reason is that, or the problem is that wheelchair users, they are basically asked to bring along a uh, personal assistant to get on board uh, because the bus companies will simply not allow the bus drivers to get out of the seat to, to help people. And therefore, many people have actually uh, given up on public transport if they are wheelchair users. And of course, this should not be the case in a, in a country like Denmark, where we like to think ourselves as someone really in favor of the inclusion and uh, and we also thought that this might be actually a human right violation. And this is why we issued the report with recommendations for politicians, uh, among other, other things, simply to change the law, to make it possible for everyone to access uh, a bus spontaneously. Uh, I should say there are other means for people with disabilities to get bus service. Uh, you, you can order a special transport, but that takes time, you'll have to wait. And there's a limit to how Often you can do that, so I guess you can imagine what that means if you want to go downtown and, and just have a cup of coffee with a good friend. Um, so we didn't think it lived up to the, it lives up to the standards that we should be having. And we also want to, to say this in a, way, in a way that engages people, and how do we do that? Uh, and without falling into the trap of just quoting you know, paragraphs and articles and, 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 and conventions, and the answer was quite straightforward because the people we have talked to for the report, they were very happy to step forward and to be part of the communication. And right now, I'll, I want you to meet one of them, Aina Bosbude, who is uh, the protagonist of one of the three videos we made. There was one time I went to Roskilde Festival. I went to the bus, and when I came to the bus, I was at the top, so I asked the bus if he could help me. Og så siger han sådan, nej. Og så er jeg sådan, 
Altså, hvordan den kommer jeg ind? Så nu skal jeg tage rampen ud. Så den kan jeg ikke. Fordi rampen var sådan et manuelt håndtag, og jeg kan ikke nå, og jeg kan... Selvom jeg kan nå, så har jeg ikke kræfterne. Fordi i sådan for at raske, er det en rigtig tung rampe. Så jeg har prøvet sådan at appellere til ham, om han ikke kunne hjælpe mig, fordi jeg, jeg kunne ikke selv. Jamen, jeg må ikke gå på min plads. Og så var han sådan færdig med at snakke med mig. Og jeg endte med at græde, fordi jeg bare... Jeg var så frustreret, og øhm, lige så snart jeg ikke... Lige snart tilgængeligheden ikke er der, så bliver jeg mindet om, at jeg har et handicap. So. This is one of three videos we've made, all with people who have given up using public transport because of the poor accessibility. We posted the, the videos on Facebook and LinkedIn, and we decided to use the tagline, the slogan, don't leave people with disabilities at the bus stop, which was literally what was happening. And we used also the hashtag buses for everyone, which worked fine. People were reacting, they were sharing, they were liking. Uh, and probably to greater extent than if we had just been posting, you know, good solid arguments and statistics. And of course, we didn't do this alone. We did it in close collaboration with the people with disabilities and also uh, in partnership with Great Minority, which is a media company who has specialized in the representation of minorities in the media. Very natural partners and uh, And in this combination, we sat down and we decided on the main uh, messages of the campaign, as well as the taglines and the and the hashtags, a very good cooperation, I'd say. And did we succeed? In a way we did, I think things are moving in the right directions. Uh, members of parliament asked to meet with the Minister of Transport. And after that meeting, he invited transport companies for a dialogue and he basically asked them to have regional meetings with uh, organizations representing uh, minorities uh, using wheelchairs and others who, who felt the, the, the results of this poor accessibility. And we haven't had new laws adopted yet. We haven't seen a national action plan as we want, but I think, I think you can say things are moving in the right direction. And also we had quite a good media uptake. On the next slide, you will see a, um, an article from the daily big daily newspaper Politiken, who did a rather large story, big story on this uh, featuring Aino and some of the other uh, people affected. And uh, yeah, that created some, some awareness. We had seen other media also taking up the story. And then you could ask, why is this a good idea? Why does this work? Why, why isn't it just as good to have you know, strong arguments, statistics, uh, facts? Uh, law and 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 is isn't people telling the story just anecdotal? And I think here I will let Ina Bosbude uh, answer that question. Jeg tror det har en stor effekt, at det er nogen, som selv har oplevet det, der fortæller om sine egne erfaringer frem for at det er en udefra, der ligesom fortæller en historie om en, der har oplevet noget. Fordi her der er den ligesom det kommer fra mit hjerte og min egen følelse er med i det. Så derfor kan det måske have en lidt bedre virkning, end hvis det bare er en, som har hørt om det. Øhm, så jeg tror på den måde, kan man nå ind til folk meget bedre. Ja. I think that kind of speaks for itself. Authenticity is key. That was one of the learnings from this campaign. And uh, of course, this is an example of real authenticity, people feeling the consequences of, of, of this problem on, yeah, very personally, very concrete. And another learning was that when doing a campaign like this, you, you depend on other people sharing it. So don't own it too much. Don't um, make it too branded with your own organization logos. Make sure that what you post is shareable, is inviting people and organizations to share it so it reaches a larger public. And finally, uh, we learned that simple messages are best. I mean, in this campaign has one message, which is basically we shouldn't leave people behind at the bus stop, which is unfortunately what happens way too often. Thank you. Thank you, Klaas. And uh, this is a really great example uh, of strong campaigns, but also on how you decide to go in either of two directions. You have clear data 
and strong um, logical arguments, but you still decided to go into the real life stories and values and inclusivity in buses for everyone. So that, that was a wise choice. Looks very good, thank you. We will hear the third example from Romania and um, saying more about it will be Maria Beatriz Berna. Hello to everybody. I am very grateful for the opportunity that you gave us to share with you the results and the content of our campaign. And um, I will make a share screen with the presentation. So our campaign refers to freedom of expression and information. Uh, we want you to underline the role of young people in promoting the democratic dialogue. And the main issue that we tackled within our campaign refers to the possible limitations and also the possible infringements or breaches in the exercise of freedom of expression and information in the context of democratic and modern societies. We also wanted to raise awareness among young people with regard to the importance of respecting freedom of information and freedom of speech within a democratic society, and also uh, the importance of respecting international and European legal standards that were adopted in this field. Um, our campaign was justified by the evolution of new technologies because uh, the communication via um, online, the communication via um, um, social networking is uh, crucial. And uh, during the COVID-19 pandemics, for example, there were disseminated uh, some fake news regarding this aspect, or also um, via online messaging. In the last period, we observed that there were many uh, hate-based messages. So we wanted to tackle all these issues. So our campaign was very ambitious because it is based on three main phases. Um, the first phase uh, refers to the webinar, freedom of expression and information in the context of existing challenges at international and national level. Uh, and uh, during this uh, webinar, there were some important messages that were conveyed by the key speakers. And uh, the most important message is that uh, within a democratic society, it's very important that uh, young people are aware of the role of freedom of expression and information and are informed by reference to some European legal standards that are very important, such as the European Convention for the Protection of Human Rights and Fundamental Freedoms or the Fundamental Rights Charter of the European Union. Also, regarding the involvement of young people within this campaign, uh, Ananda Simeon, uh, which is um, as a human rights coordinator, gave some opinions in a testimonial video. Hello, my name is Ananda Simeon, and uh, I would like to present my experience both as a participant and also as an organizer of the human rights campaign on the liberty of expression. Firstly, as an organizer, I uh, had the chance to develop a clear vision on this uh, area of human rights by uh, constantly speaking with professionals in the field and uh, by doing research on this topic. It was a real pleasure to work with experts from the Romanian Institute of Human Rights and uh, to have brainstorming sessions in order to decide the structure of the event. Uh, moreover, the thought that we are working uh, to raise awareness on uh, such a significant topic kept me motivated and uh, eager to make this, uh, campa this campaign successful. And uh, as a participant, I uh, had a chance to become more knowledgeable with uh, various aspects of the liberty of expression and uh, I sincerely hope that uh, all the participants enjoyed uh, the event as much as I did. Mm, all in all, I uh, have to say that uh, I am proud of this campaign and uh, of the fact that we managed to express our enthusiasm for human rights in the form of such an amazing event. 
Thank you very much. The second phase of our campaign refers to an essay contest entitled Censorship and Public Morality in the Dystopian World, where organizers tried to cultivate some skills, argumentative skills, narrative skills, critical thinking skills of the students that were involved in the essay contest. Here are some ideas that I've extracted from the essays that were presented by students. And also the third phase of our campaign uh, consisted in a follow-up webinar entitled Diversity and Tolerance from Freedom of Thought to Freedom of Speech. And uh, it is a very important point of our campaign because the final conclusion of the campaign were presented during this webinar. And also the winners of the essays were granted a two weeks uh, internship at the Romanian Institute for Human Rights. And during this internship, uh, there were organized vivid debates about some, um, some important uh, aspects regarding communication and human rights communication, such as equality and non-discrimination, the rights of people with disabilities, uh, human women's rights, children's rights, and other specific aspects. The objective that we propose to fulfill uh, under this campaign refer to short-term object objectives and also long-term objectives. And uh, both of these objectives were uh, fulfilled because uh, referring to the results of the campaign, the goals that we've achieved refer to involving youth in actions of rising awareness regarding the importance of freedom of expression and information, developing those specific skills that I already told you about when uh, presenting the essay contest, that is argumentation, communication during the debate, critical thinking. Also, uh, an important result of the campaign was changing behavioral patterns concerning freedom of expression and information. Uh, we wanted to make uh, young people more responsible when, when analyzing the relationship between rights and responsibilities when exerting uh, freedom of speech and also freedom of thought. And the main goal that uh, I think that we have uh, achieved through this campaign refers to creating a new generation of human rights defenders through the power of narrative. Because when... Um, uh, the students were exposed to the several juridical and also moral and ethical implications of exerting uh, freedom of expression, freedom of information. They also understood the role that they have, that is to pass over this information to other students so that they also can raise awareness referring to, to the problems that are related to freedom of expression and information. Thank you very much. And I send you these virtual flowers as a sign of my appreciation. Thank you. That's brilliant. Um, thank you very much, Beatrice, for the presentation and the, and the virtual flowers. Um, <laughs> And, th and thanks for the yeah for the wonderful kind of um, presentation on your on your campaign there around the the rights of information and um, expression and and raising awareness with uh, with young people or whatever. So it's it's really good to kind of see that you um, your organisation um, is, is listening to and connecting with your audience and and, and learning from them as well um, and inspiring kind of change in action um, as a result of your campaign. That's super. Um, so yeah. Um, that's our, our presentation kind of section kind of done. So we're just going to move on and, and ask a couple of questions to our to our kind of panel members and get their thoughts on a couple of things related to to communications. Um, I suppose the first thing up would be would be around evaluating the impact and the success of your of your campaigns. Um, so I mean, I'd like to I'll take it in turns, but I'd like to ask our presenters just how did you measure the impact of your campaign? Um, what, what learning from the campaign would you take forward for future projects? And are there any strengths or, or improvements you think you would you would take kind of going forward? Um, so I'm just gonna jump to Clace first, if you can sum that up. Yeah, it's a good question. How do you measure impact from the campaign? I mean, of course, we're very interested to see whether anything's happening politically and we're happy that some things are. And whether that is due to the to the uh, media campaign or to our report and our direct contact politicians is of course hard to, to say. We like to think it's a combination of both. We think we need both. Uh, going forward, I think one thing we learned is that, you know, we did three videos. 
we ended up using all three of them, but one of them much more than the other two because they had so much more impact. Can you know from the beginning which one that would be? Maybe we could. I think we had the feeling when we saw the three of them. And, and maybe sometimes you don't need to do three videos just to make your, uh, your message uh, heard. Uh, I see too often organizations like ours uh, thinking that we can only post something on Facebook once and then it's out there. Uh, I've seen many other organizations who actually use the same material over and over again to, 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 to a point where you, yeah, they started getting tired of it and, 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 and the public has only seen it perhaps once or even not even once still. So I think that's one thing, not to overdo communication, but just to do what really works. Um, yeah, but basically I think what we learned from this campaign is that people do relate to something that is as, as relatable as, as people who have these uh, very concrete experiences on their own body. That's brilliant. Yeah, um, would totally agree with that. Finding the balance between um, not overdoing it and 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 not and underselling your 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 campaign and your good work and things like that. So that's super. Um, Beatrice, would you be able to answer it next? Yes, thank you for your question. Um, I think that what I have learned from this campaign is that uh, young people are, are very, very enthusiastic to contribute to the um, uh, empowerment of human rights, also to formulate their own human rights-based approach when uh, expressing their thoughts, when uh, interacting in dialogue with others, with other members of society. And I think that uh, they are very enthusiastic. They uh, bring uh, many new ideas and original ideas. And I think that it is also our duty and our right to support them in order to make uh, their message uh, very well delivered and clearly de delivered within the society. And uh, I was very much impressed by their need to, to develop a partnership with our institution. The representative of the European Law Students Association uh, wanted to, to keep in touch with the Institute in a very formal base. And they suggested to, to accomplish a partnership between the Romanian Institute for Human Rights and their organization so that they can feel at all times supported and endorsed by our organization in what they want to achieve um, in uh, ways of uh, public expression. So I think that um, by ways of concluding this partnership, we, we present our full support to all the initiatives that the young people have in the field of human rights and in the field of freedom of expression and information. So for me, it was a, a very, very important uh, experience that changed and moved me in, in very many, many ways. Super, thanks very much, Beatrice. I think you're right. I think young people do bring lots of new and fresh ideas and give us a, a different way of kind of looking at things. So it's definitely good to take their to take their ideas and, and messages kind of on board. Um, and then Lisa, would you like to answer please? Yeah, thank you. I couldn't agree more with uh, Beatrice about the young people's energy and, and impact uh, because uh, this was clearly seen also in our TV series because uh, young people who acted there were not professionals and they added with their own stories. In our case, uh, we um, measured how many people watched actually the series. So this is something that you can measure with numbers. And it was much more than we expected. And uh, because of the uh, audience love to this series, um, the national broadcast repeated it, repeated it again, and then repeated it again. And now they are streaming it uh, with a great popularity. So uh, it's uh, 2021 now, and they are still uh, getting new audiences. So um, measuring the audience interest was, in our case, uh, the measurement we did. We didn't do any social studies about how the gender stereotypes actually changed. Yeah, no, that's that's super. Yes, the numbers speak for themselves, and the and the clamor to wa watch and rewatch again your your TV show. So definitely a measure of success. Well, that's super. I'm going to hand over to Anna now for the the second question. 
Yes, we will be talking a little bit more about collaboration and I'm going to start with uh, Maria Beatrice who already touched uh, on this subject and I loved how she said that the collaboration even changed and moved you within the, the institution. So you already, already noted a bit on uh, the importance of the partnership um, for your work and especially with youth. Um, and uh, I just want to ask you, how, how do you approach uh, building those collaborations, those partnerships? Yes, thank you. It's, uh, it's a very um, interesting question because I think that uh, it is very important to, to, to keep very close a uh, very close relationship with our young people in order to encourage them to express their opinions, their ideas. And we have both um, uh, internships that are um, under uh, current uh, evaluation. Also, we have our partnership that entails much more than just internships. We have uh, common campaigns, we have um, contests, uh, we have um, any other initiative that uh, that the students bring us, we are uh, with full support and our uh, organization provides them with all the technical and also uh, personal uh, feedback and, uh, and uh, guidance assistance. And uh, I think that uh, in this way we, we collaborate and it is very, very important as I, I said earlier, to, to make sure that our relationship is very close because uh, it is very important when delivering the message regarding youth and human rights, it is very important to take into account all the features and all the needs that young people have. And this cannot be made effective only by uh, a strict and close collaboration. And I think that young people are very, I think that we, we gained their trust. I think they, they trust us in order to conduct in, in the future many, many uh, partnerships in the field of human rights. It, it sounds like they had a reason to trust you. Yes. You, uh, you really tailored your approach uh, towards them and you really were uh, supportive. That, that's really impressive. Thank you. Uh, Lisa, uh, let's hear from you on this also. Why do you think partnerships are so important and uh, how do you approach building them in your work? A task of uh, overcoming uh, limiting stereotypes uh, is a huge work and, uh, and uh, not easy to do to be done. So in, in this case, our most important partners were schools, school teachers, and uh, we really wanted uh, the schools to understand where the gender biased uh, recommendations for career paths uh, can be, like uh, tech is not for girls or boys are not to become uh, kindergarten teachers, etc. And uh, we really appreciate it uh, the possibility to go with a comedy to a school and talk about uh, gender stereotypes and their limitations. So um, uh, building this uh, uh, partnership with the schools was extra valuable because in many cases, the students were more active maybe even than the teachers to talk about the issues uh, more thoroughly and to ask more questions than, uh, than it was fought in, in the beginning and to also put their own effort uh, to the limitations that the gender biased uh, career paths might offer. So uh, without the partnership with schools, I guess also the number of young audience uh, looking to the TV series would have remained smaller. Definitely a good place to go schools. You know, some might say, oh, it sounds so complicated. You have to, you know, contact them and then they are uh, minors and you have legal applications, things like that. But at the end, we see in your example that the effort is really worth it also, right? Christ, do you want to reflect more on, on these two questions? Yeah, as it has been mentioned, it is about many things. I mean, it's, it's of course about having different uh, strong points. We as the Institute of Human Rights in Denmark, we are good at many things, but we might not be specialists in how to reach 
for instance, young audiences. Actually, we've just created a new, a new very big partnership called the Human Rights Alliance with the sole purpose of trying to create awareness and, and support for human rights among youth. And we have very, very interesting partners here. We partner, we partner up with, for instance, the Roskiller Festival, which you may heard about, one of the biggest Europe, uh, European music festivals, uh, in contact with thousands of young people every year. We uh, partner up with an organization specializing in, uh, in e-gaming. Uh, we have no way uh, on ourselves to reach these young people sitting in the basement with their computer. And you see here how I have all my, my stereotypes of, of, of gamers. Uh, we don't meet them, but they do. So if we need to create any kind of awareness or difference or, or, or even speak to them at a level where they think we're taking them seriously, we need, we need those partnerships. And it's the same for the, for the videos we, we make. Uh, of course, I could have been there with my camera and I could have filmed Aina and, and the other people, but having great minority also, uh, it's just, it just adds so much more. And the other thing about partnerships is, of course, reach. That uh, if you are more organizations, the, the, the likelihood that you reach more people is so much bigger. I mean, if they're also the not so formalized partnerships, if we call uh, organizations who work with people with disabilities and say, listen, we have this campaign, would you like to share it? We can instantly just double or quadruple our, our, our reach, our impact. So I think it's it's impossible to underestimate um, the value of to overestimate the value of partnerships. Thank you, Clarice. You know, it's, it's it's good that I have my pen and paper next to me so I can write all the notes from you three and your uh, uh, experience and presentations. Thank you. Uh, I believe that Jason has more questions for you now. Yeah. Thanks very much, Anna. Yes, this is our, our sort of final sort of main panel sort of discussion question, and it's just around the, the importance of communication. So I'd just like to ask our panel, so um, what, what do you, why do you think communication is essential in your work as a, as a national equality body or national human rights institution? And then just on top of that, just um, have you ensured or are you ensuring that communication is seen as strategic within your, your organization? Um, so I'd like to jump to Lisa, for the answer to the first. Uh, thank you. Uh, yes, it's definitely on a very strategic place. We take, uh, we analyze the claims we get in. And uh, if there is an area where there are more claims, we start to prevent the discrimination in this area. And this is possible only with a general uh, communication uh, with very many different possibilities that you have within this uh, communication. Uh, it is also target group speci specific, so you have to do a lot of work after you have uh, uh, understood the problem and how to avoid it, repeating. Uh, but uh, the main thing is that you don't lay a problem into the place when you get it in, but you do always something to prevent it happening in the future. So our main aim is that uh, we don't have... Uh, we are not interested in the number of cases so much we are we are working with. This is, of course, very important as well, but we are very much interested in, so to say, not to have new discrimination cases and you need to work with this and the communication is one of the best tools to do it. Absolutely. Thank you. Yeah, no, yeah, I'd agree um, wholeheartedly. It's it's definitely kind of moving forward and trying to change things is is... is yeah, you've got to have sort of communications, comms, uh, sort of to, uh, as a base point to kind of change people's um, perceptions and 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 whatnot. Their their kind of their ideas. So that's super. Um, Cleus. Yeah, I I, um, I like to be a bit cocky and say communication is not important. Communication is everything, uh, and I say that sometimes also in the organisation here because. You know, what we do at the Danish Institute for Human Rights is basically we communicate, we advise, we share our, our views, our analysis. Uh, everything we do is via communication, whether we, when, it's, we, when we talk directly to decision makers, politicians, parliament, or when we talk to the broader public. And I think there's a great awareness about that in our organizations. We feel 
we're really on board. I mean, of course, we are on the board of directors, but we're also really on board. Our, there's a huge demand for our, for our services. I think the trap might sometimes be that uh, people ask for a solution that they think they know what is. So they say, could you please post these three tweets or could you please create a brochure about this? And I think the main goal for us as communicators is to stand and say, now, how do we know that this works? And, and ask the clever communication questions. How do you know that this is the way we better to, to best reach our target audiences? Uh, again, whether those be politicians or, 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 or special interest groups, organizations uh, for the public. So um, I, luckily, we don't have to fight for, uh, for the position within the organization. We just have to work quite systematically to ensure that communication is being used strategically and not only uh, as, a, yeah, as a vehicle for saying something. Brilliant. Um, Chris, thank you very much. I think that's maybe one of the, the top lines that we'll take away from this is uh, communications is, is everything. <laughs> I can sum, sum it all up, um, but that's brilliant. Yes, it's great that you kind of have buy-in organization-wide and everyone kind of understands the importance of communications and that kind of helps push your work forward as well. So it's great that that they have that kind of that buy-in. Um, and Beatrice, finally. Yes. Um... We, the Romanian uh, Institute for Human Rights, uh, we um, have a specific mandate that is uh, mostly oriented towards um, exercising the promotion of human rights. So we promote human rights through specific activities uh, like education in the field of human rights, research in the field of human rights, information, yes, to the... Um, uh, large uh, public, and also through through activities such as lobby and advocacy in the field of human rights. So, in order to have uh, an efficient approach uh, when uh, interacting with citizens, we have to to have a very good, good communication that is based not only on assessing formal aspects. But mainly we focus also on the spiritual level, on being empathetic uh, towards the citizens, because one of the main goals of our institute is to create at the national level and to promote also at national level a human rights culture. And in order to promote a human rights culture, we have to promote humanistic values, such as collaboration, solidarity, tolerance, acceptance. And I think that communication in this sense is not only a necessary mean, but the most important tool in order to reach out to the common citizen and to help him by understanding the problem. So communication is the key in solving human rights problems because uh, on one hand, it enables us to understand the problem uh, and I underline not only at the formal level, but also uh, by taking into account the personal aspect of the individual. And also, it enables us to formulate an effective strategy in order to address that problem. So, narrative, as I said in my presentation, is one of the motives uh, to, to form a new generation of human rights defenders. So yes, it is very, very important for our activity. Yeah, that's super. I think you, 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 you wrapped it up kind of very well there and um, just how important, just how much um, work is done by communications and how important it is for, for um, human rights and equality bodies to, to be able to carry out their mandate through, through this promotion and raising awareness and things like that. So yes, it's just yeah a very essential part to kind of keep these organizations moving and, and fulfilling their, their kind of obligations and, and duties. Um, well, that's super. Um, I think I'm going to hand, hand over to Anna now. Yes, well, the time is uh, running really, really fast. We have now come to the part where we share our very short takeaways. So what would you say, say implies, starting with you, um, what would you put out as the key ingredient for creating inspiring campaigns that tackle human rights and equality issues? 
Well, uh, obviously, since it's human rights, it's about people. And sometimes we tend to forget that, I think, or we fight to find out what is the human angle here. And I found out that very often it's difficult to actually use cases. It's difficult to find uh, people who are able to step forward because it can be very, very difficult issues. Sometimes then we have used actually cartoons, we've used drawings, we've used illustrations to still make it relatable, make it human. Uh, I think so one takeaway is we need to make it relatable and, and have a human angle. And another one is also that we need there need to be there needs to be kind of a surprise, an element of surprise, uh, because too much communication also in our area. Um, it's just it's just um, things we have said before in the same way, and I think it's when we come up with something that really surprises people that people will, will remember it. Yes, and, and there's the formula to click with uh, with the public, so you can you can raise awareness and make a change. Beatrice, what would you say is the key takeaway? Uh, I think that the key takeaway in promoting the power of narrative refers to understanding, better understanding ourselves as human beings, because only by better understanding ourselves, we can better understand human rights. I think that the power of narrative is about cultivating, cultivating human rights values, is about making them uh, aware in society, is about promoting them, is about um, reaching out to people through a new perspective, a new strategy that is empowered by, uh, by young people. And uh, I truly believe that only by changing and shaping the personality of young people, by changing their behaviors, their attitudes, by making them more sensitive towards human rights and towards a human rights-based approach, uh, only by take by doing all of that, we can uh, ensure a human rights culture and a human rights climate within democratic societies. I think that it, this is the key element in order to consolidate democratic societies for the common good. Well said, thank you. Lisa, what would you like to add to this? Uh, I would put on table actually two things. Uh, first is that, uh, yes, uh, uh, strategic thinking and uh, special knowledge is very important, but you might have all the strategic thinking and uh, best of knowledge how to do one or another thing. We actually used uh, knowledge from Tallinn University how to do cross-media. Mm, but the main thing is that uh, with all this knowledge, you have to solve real life problems with enthusiasm. So both things are important, that there should be real life problems. People uh, have to understand that these are real life problems. And it is needed a lot of enthusiasm to go out with this because the topics are sometimes very hard and you need really much bigger input uh, than maybe when you are marketing other issues than human rights. So solve real life problems with lots of enthusiasm, but using the strategic thinking and uh, um, appropriate knowledge behind it as well is the key, I think. Thank you so much. Thank you, Lisa, really, thank you. Jason, would you like to add something maybe about the key ingredients of successful and inspiring campaigns? Um, yeah, I, I guess just from, from hearing everyone today and, 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 and what they've kind of had to say, I, I think what came through was um, like creating um, coalitions and doing things with other organizations and other stakeholders and tapping into their kind of audiences and how we can kind of uh, learn from them or learn from people who are maybe closer to, to certain issues that we're trying to highlight, then the power of us kind of getting together and, and promoting kind of one message or, or promoting human rights kind of that way is just we're going to reach far more many people with our message. And we're also going to kind of have a message that's, you know, coming from, as mentioned, maybe by Lisa, um, you know, coming from kind of authentic experience from the voices of people who who maybe have have gone through this um or you know who have experience of these issues so i think yeah creating coalitions partnering up getting together with stakeholders and and, and working to, working together on a project can can really help get your your message out there and help kind of change narratives and and and, and make really great campaigns and initiatives 
Well, after hearing all of you, I can just add that the, my key ingredient for creating inspiring campaigns is talk to your colleagues, listen to what they do and how they think and how they approach their work. I'm really happy that you shared these examples with us and also that we had this short, but I would say really uh, fruitful and straightforward uh, discussions on the, on, the, on the questions that we raised. Um, I saw that your campaigns, they really stood out. So that would also be a, an, an important ingredient that I would uh, put out and uh, emphasize to have strong stories, strong narratives. I mean, anyone listening to Aina is surely going to remember her in, in the following, in, in the future as well. Uh, there are also very clear objectives of your campaigns, which is also important to stay focused, to know what you are aiming for, and of course, to measure it and know um, how good of a job you have done and what should you do a bit differently next or the same the next time to repeat your success. So your campaigns have really, really shown us how communication can help rights holders to better understand their rights and to empower them to, um, to create change. And we have also, thanks to you, seen how to build the narratives to, to support that code. Um, all institutions that have presented the examples today are members of either Equinet or ENRI or both. Uh, and these networks, uh, they work with their members to amplify their communication work to tackle better and more successfully equality and human rights, uh, I wouldn't say problems, I would say challenges. And you can find out more um, if you visit their channels, which you can see now on screen. Jason? Yeah, thanks, Anna. Um, yeah, so finally, um, the session today couldn't capture all of the uh, all of the examples or all of the great work that that NHRIs and equality bodies are doing in the in the communications and sort of campaigns field. Um, however, down the line, uh, a blog will be posted on both the Enry and Equinet websites, which will highlight um, some of the some more of the initiatives um, and campaigns that have that have been done um, by the various kind of equality and and national human rights institutions. As well, worth kind of um, checking that out. So just keep an eye out on, on on both their websites, and it should be up very shortly. So I think we're just going to wrap up now. Um, I'm going to say thanks very much to all of our speakers and thanks very much to Anna for co-hosting with myself uh, and thanks very much for everyone who, who tuned in and, and watched uh, so I'd like to say good luck and, and maybe you'll continue these conversations after after this thing wraps up here and um, so I'd like to say goodbye and if our if our speakers or anyone else wants to say goodbye please feel free to do so thank you bye-bye thank you great great talking to you yeah, I hope you all the best with your communication, whether it is with yourself, with your colleagues, with your family, or with your wider audience in order to uh, get a more equal world around us. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. And uh, I hope that we will collaborate in the future in order to strengthen the communication in the field of human rights. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Super, thank you. Thank you all.